I'm Shane Morris with the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. Today we present Session 5 of Doing the Right Thing, an exploration of ethics with Britt Hume, Robert George, and Chuck Colson. As with the other sessions, this episode was filmed in front of a student audience. Let's get right to Session 5, Ethics in the Marketplace. Here's series host, Britt Hume. Welcome back to Princeton, where we're in the midst of a series of classes on the subject of ethics. In this session, we'll be discussing how we take what we've learned about ethics and the pursuit of virtue and apply it in the marketplace. So the broader question today is, is there a way to provide the necessary moral restraint for free societies to survive? Is it possible to have ethical standards which govern our behavior in the marketplace? That is, when we go to work or when we invest our money or when we buy products. What we'll be discussing today affects every one of us. The question before the House is this. Can we assure the necessary moral restraints for a free market system to work? We'll hear as well from a man who knows what the lack of ethics means in the business world, Eric Pilmore, a successful businessman and expert on ethics who went in to clean up the mess at Tyco in the wake of Tyco Chief Dennis Kozlowski's criminal acts. This was 2002, uh, in the midst of kind of Enron, WorldCom, and Tyco. There was a CEO of the company who had charges brought against him related to his personal tax situation, which basically led to the uncovering of a major fraud, a theft of $600 million by the CFO and the CEO. And I was part of the turnaround team brought in in the summer of 2002 to help investigate what had happened and then, more importantly, look at what needed to change in order to get the company back on its feet and to participate in trying to rebuild the integrity and reputation of financial markets in the U.S. The company was led by a man by the name of Dennis Kozlowski, who was a autocratic, intimidating leader, leading a company of 240,000 people, but leading it basically out of fear. Via his you know, ability to bring the types of people in, create processes with no accountability, and then lead via this, you know, this process where he basically built blind ambition into the minds of the people and really sought what I'll call selfish ambition. You know, we always say it's lonely at the top. Well, it is. You know, there's a, there's a real emptiness. And the, the dream is, if I can just achieve this much more, I'll fill that emptiness. And, you know, we all know that's not true. But the psychology of the individual at the time, I think, particularly in these heady times in the late 90s and the early part of this decade, folks, you know, pursued that, pursued wealth at kind of any cost and without really any regard for others. It was more driven by selfish greed. Here's Chuck Colson. One of the things I'd like to throw out on the table is that we really do live in an age of obsessive individualism. Corporate executives go in to see how much money they can make out of a corporation rather than what that corporation can do. The historic classical model that we follow in the West is one that cares deeply about producing products and services that are of benefit to the public, that takes care of its working force, that invests back in the community in which it resides. And let me let you hear from Ben Stein, and here's what he said about obsessive individualism. We have a business model in this country which is just heartbreakingly uh, unethical. Um, not everywhere, there's still people founding great companies, but the p real problem, I think, is, a, is the problem of the manager who, who really believes he has only one obligation, and that obligation is to just make as much money as fast as he can and get the heck out of there before anybody catches him. I mean, that's sort of how it's done. It's, it's not uh, based on trying to have any kind of long-term plan for helping the country or the company or the employees or the stockholders. It's just, how can I loot this company for myself? So how widespread are ethical failures in the business world? Tyco, of course, is a dramatic example, but can we really know how deeply these problems run in our culture? What are other indicators we can see? Here's Robert George. Well, I think, um one thing we all know is that uh, human beings, as human beings, we're prone to selfishness. Christians have an account of that called original sin. It's part of our nature. So then, then the question becomes, what economic system, what political system, what kind of cultural order would tend to promote or uh, exacerbate the problem of selfishness and what might ameliorate it a bit? 
And the question that's always been put to free market people, and I myself am a defender of the market economy, the regulated market economy, but the question that's legitimately put is this. Does the market system, based on the profit motive, uh, presuppose or promote selfishness? Is it part of the problem that everyone recognizes we have in the culture, which uh, the late uh, Robert P. Casey, the former governor of Pennsylvania, once called the cult of the imperial self? This tendency to focus on myself, my own goals, my own achievement, without regard to others, without regard to the common good. That's the question. It is perhaps the genius of the capitalist system that it harnesses the natural tendency toward greed in such a way that no greedy and successful businessman or entrepreneur can accomplish his or her goals without other people. And if you do well, they do well. And jobs are created. It's how the whole thing works. In a very real sense, uh, vice is, is harnessed to a virtuous outcome. But in the case of Tyco and innumerable other recent cases, it all went terribly wrong. So the question arises is, you know, how do we get from that kind of unrestrained greed and self-centeredness um, for all the good it may do. I was a Tyco stockholder. When the stock went in the tank, I bought. I bought with both hands. I ended up coming out. I have probably a good feeling about Tyco. In the end, although I'm no fan of Dennis Kozlowski. So the question arises, what, what, do we, what do we need? What's missing? What needs to be added here? Scott Ray responds. I think our view of this gets a little bit skewed because Tyco, Enron, WorldCom, those are the ones that make news. But the, the myriad of corporations that do things correctly, uh, that abide by the law and by moral standards, don't, aren't particularly newsworthy. So I think there, there are millions and millions of transactions that take place every day that are premised on trust and virtue. And I think the market system, I think it does, it does civilize greed in that way. But the market also require, both requires and nurtures another set of virtues. Uh, it requires the virtue of service. It requires the virtue of hard work and discipline and diligence. Uh, it requires the, the, the virtue of creativity and innovation. Michael Miller responds. You know, I, I would also say that greed is a human vice. Right? It's not a capitalist vice. A, a market economy, a free economy, uh, requires a host of things. It requires private property, rule of law, so you need to have justice. It requires free association, that people are allowed to get together to work together. And it, and it requires free exchange. But it also requires a culture of trust. And individualism, like Alexis de Tocqueville said, individualism is one of the dangers of democracy. People turn into themselves. And he says equality also creates love of comfort. And so you have to stop that through being involved in, in, in society and also uh, through religion. When you lose a sense of trust and, a, and, you, and, you, and you have a kind of deep-seated greedy individuals uh, separated from anything else, market economies fail. Market economies rely upon an ethical structure. They didn't pop out of nowhere. They actually popped out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, especially in the Middle Ages. And they require certain kinds of people from certain kinds of families in order for them to sustain. David Miller joins in. Certainly would agree with the concept of trust. There's no doubt that's fundamental. But I'd also say that, that for people who are in the marketplace, what makes one company tilt from being starting out as ethical and moral and decent to suddenly failing and, and, and finding themselves doing the, the perp walk someday? For a lot of it, it's the people in the organization. Do they have a sense of vision and meaning and purpose in what they're doing? If they think they're just making chairs or glasses or, 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 or pens, something simple, a function, a widget, they don't really care. But if they see their, that what they do somehow makes society a better place, somehow provides goods and services, they ignite, they come alive, and they will be proud of their company. They will also stand up for it. Right, let's get the students involved here. Who has a question? Yes, sir. Hi, Joel Alisea. I uh, was listening to the panel's discussion of some of the absolute values, the non-contingent values that undergird, uh, as uh, Professor Miller said, a, a, a free economy, uh, this idea of integration with the community and a responsibility to, to the community and other values like that. But I wanted to press this point a little bit and ask whether or not the day-to-day -day decisions that business leaders have to make are not in some way in tension with those values. Uh, because these decisions that have to be made on a day-to-day -day basis are cost-benefit decisions, which is there's nothing inherently wrong about that. But 
can that, can't that form habits of mind that are utilitarian in nature, contingent in nature, such that p these business leaders start to regard all things as contingent, as based on what is in the interest of the bottom line? That's a fantastic question. And it is very possible that you could think in a utilitarian manner all the time, and so that you, everything that you do becomes utilitarian. But I would say that the main cause of that is not really the business, but the utilitarian vision of culture, of ethics, that kind of permeates the culture, period. Secondly, as a manager, you're not just making utilitarian decisions, cost-benefit decisions every day. I mean, I manage just a small group of people, and most of my decisions are human decisions. The, the goal of the manager is, how can I help this person in front of me have a flourishing human life so they can grow, and when they leave and they don't work for me anymore, they think, that was great, I learned a lot. I mean, I think if, you are, if you're only thinking in cost-benefit, then I think what you're doing is you're reducing the business merely to its profit-making element. But as Peter Drucker says, the goal of a business is to create a customer. And the, goal, and, and the goal of a manager is not merely to make profit, but to create sustainable value. And on the second thing is, can it have negative impacts? Absolutely. I mean, look, Adam Smith, the greatest proponent of free markets ever, said, what happens when business people get in the room, rarely do they get together, they don't conspire to rip off the public. Okay? I mean, that's Adam Smith, because people will do bad things. And when there's a lot of money in front of you, the temptations are great. But that doesn't mean that the enterprise of business is fundamentally immoral, right? Just like the enterprise of, of a university is not fundally, fundamentally immoral just because you have immoral people working there. Or even right? of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even of Congress. <laughs> That's pushing it. <laughs> so what does a responsible corporate citizen look like today? To answer that, we talked to Father Robert Sirico of the Acton Institute. Having the vocation, if you will, of work places within the hands of every man and woman who is involved at various aspects of enterprise and business uh, a certain stewardship responsibility. Now a steward is a person who may not own the property and in this sense I mean own in the sense of having created it from nothing but that we have some responsibility over its care, over its productivity, over its extension. David Miller again. And so uh, the stewardship responsibility that uh, men and women of enterprise have is a responsibility to keep their eye on all of the dimensions of their enterprise, which has to do certainly with the productivity, that is to say profit making, because without profit, uh, you, you don't have a sign that you're doing what you set out to do. But in addition to that, all of the factors that go into enterprise uh, has to do with the natural environment, it has to do with the people who are collaborating with you in that enterprise, it has to do with the people to whom you are selling the products of your labor, it has to do with your suppliers. So it really is a whole set of human actions that are taking place in a community, enterprise, the market, is never an individualistic thing. It is always an individual in cooperation with other individuals, either to produce, to buy, or to sell. I think that one of the reasons that work has such a, uh, an incredible moral dimension is because there are very few other things that can touch so many aspects of human life, whereby the work that we engage in, the property that we produce from that engagement is so closely associated with uh, ourselves, with our lives. It's a way in which we extend our life. It's a way in which we live our life. If you consider it deeply enough, you understand that work exemplifies some of the most creative aspects of who human beings are. Human beings are not bound to things by instinct. Animals are bound to things by instinct. Human beings are bound to things by the use of their reason, by their intellectual capacity, by their choices, and by a moral dimension that they bring to it. In response to that first question, producing products in the common interest, we interviewed two businessmen. Bob Rowling took a courageous step, which he believed was in the public interest, even though it could have cost him a lot of money in the short term. 
Then we'll hear from Doug DeVos, who talked about the values his father built into the DNA of the Amway Corporation and how his company continues to be guided by that vision today. We got into the hotel business in the early 90s and acquired Omni in 1996. In about 1999, we made the decision to remove pornography from our hotels. And I've been asked why we made that decision. When we first got in the business in the early 90s, uh, hotels showed R-rated movies. Uh, and we saw a progression where the, the, the content became more and more X, double X rated. So in the late 90s, uh, we decided that we were going to pull the pornography out of all of our hotels. And the decision uh, was not without some internal debate in our company. Uh, we had people, it cost us a lot of revenue. About 60% of the uh, movie revenue that comes into hotels is from pornography. There's never been a debate, I don't think, in our society that, that pornography uh, denigrates women, uh, it destroys families, it leads to crime. Uh, it doesn't do, there's no redeeming societal benefit to pornography. And in fact, just the opposite, it, it actually ruins uh, people's lives. People become addicted to it. And it was an interesting response when we pulled it. Uh, we, we received, I think over the years, we've had over 100,000 emails, letters, thank yous, uh, letters from men who say, look, I travel on business. Uh, I have a family, a wife and family. I'm tempted when I go to a hotel that offers pornography. Thank you for pulling it out. Uh, and so we made a decision that we thought was going to cost us money. I think because of the uh, public relations, good public relations that came with it, I think we've actually at least broken even. I don't think it's cost us a dime by being a good corporate responsible citizen. The role that we have and the relationship that we have with the community here in Ada and Grand Rapids kind of comes from one of those founders fundamentals of family. That, uh, that this was a community where dad and Jay grew up, where we grew up. And, and there's all sorts of people, teachers and coaches and, and colleagues and friends that, and, and other families that were there to support you and look after you when you stayed overnight at a friend's house or when something else happened here. That, that makes this a wonderful community atmosphere. Our view of long term is we want a, a great community. These are, these are our future employees. These are our future customers. These are our future advisors. These are people who are going to create things in this community that we didn't think of yet. They're going to they're create new products or new businesses that never existed before. Well, it, it's, the, it's the long term perspe perspective and it's a faith perspective as well. I think we have to talk about that. Doing the right things, that's what makes you happy. So you do good things by having a good business and you do good things by giving back in a proper way to a good community. I know Rich DeVos, who's plowed millions back into Grand Rapids, as many of the Dutch families have. He does that because he loves that community. He was raised in it. When he started his business, he started with his neighbors. This whole idea of being rooted in the community, this whole idea about caring about the people that helped you rise up the corporate ladder, those are good models. That's what we have to, that's, that's what we have to honor that. What we see here in the person of these executives are people who clearly themselves have some strong moral compass. It guides their actions and it guides, therefore, the behavior of their corporations. But how do we arrange the incentives for all corporate managers and leaders in, in such a way that, and we all understand the incentive for profit, that, that's a necessity, but that creates as well a sense of, of commitment to the community, a sense of the need to run your businesses in an ethical way. How do we do that? I mean, I think there are a lot of things, but let me say one area. I mean, one thing I think we have to have a proper understanding of what business is and then the role of business in society. And oftentimes we start with a negative view of business, that somehow business is just taking from society. But the point is business contributes to the common good in a very positive way. And if you have that vision of how business works from the beginning, if you start a business or you're working in business, I think this is going to have a positive influence on the way you run your business. Uh, Michael, I think that point is fundamentally right. You know, businesses can do evil as well as good. Absolutely. They're, businesses are created and run by human beings. And uh, there's good and evil in us. Uh, you know, the line between good and evil, as it's been famously said, runs right down the middle of the, human, of the heart. human heart. What I found very compelling, especially about Bob Rowling's testimony, uh, is the recognition implicit in what he said that business really can do things 
that will be damaging to the common good of society and ultimately undermine business itself, undermine the free economy itself by doing things like selling pornography, which undermines the institution of the family, on which business, like every other institution of society, law, government, the economy, depends. If you do things in business that undermine that very institution, you're producing the rope to hang yourself. So how do good leaders do just that, to tilt towards the good as opposed to towards evil? I think we saw in those, those clips, uh, take Bob Riley, powerful example. The first thing, which is maybe the hardest, is he recognized that there was something wrong. It was industry practice. It was nothing illegal. He wasn't breaking any codes, any regulations, but he sensed something in his inner clock or his inner compass said, something's not right. The second thing, and he had the courage to say it, the second thing, so he goes against the grain, is he talks about it. Instead of just issuing an executive fiat, we're all going to stop it tomorrow and have people mutter and think he's lost his brain, he talked about a vigorous conversation that they had. They debated the pros and cons. And then finally, it sounds like he made a decision. So he trained his people, he trained his leaders to deal with tough questions and to take decisions that may cost you money. He made it very clear, he was almost surprised that, that the financials worked out in the end. This is what we're trying to do in this whole series is show examples of good stewardship, good ethical behavior, which become the model rather than the obsessive individualism, I want to get everything I can. Now, what Professor George is talking about is how over the long term, those decisions actually nourish the society and, uh, and ultimately nourish your enterprise. But beyond that, are there other reasons why you should be good corporate stewards and run your companies on a I have a proposal basis? for you, Britt. Uh, these days, people seem to um, think that there's something very bad about stigmatizing people, stigmatizing other people. Well, I think we don't do enough stigmatizing. We should stigmatize people who engage in bad behavior, destructive behavior in business or elsewhere, even if it's not illegal behavior. And the other side of that is we should honor people like these people who do the right thing for the right reason and are willing to take risks with the bottom line in order to do the right thing. So the first step, I think, would be to honor people who deserve to be honored and let's re-stigmatize bad business practices, well, destructive some, business practices. There's some of that practices. going on. I mean, it, the environmental movement has had a powerful impact. It's got every corporation in America just about trying to outdo itself in terms of being Well, we, we stigmatized the cigarette industry. We did. But we have to face Brit's question square on, and I think this is it. In the short run, it can cost you money. Oh, sure. It might even put your business in jeopardy. So it takes a strong will, a strong moral sense and a strong will to be able to, to take those risks. Let's not forget the, the, the one elephant in the room we haven't talked about, and that, that's money. One of the ways to incent behavior is to align compensation systems with desired outcomes. And some of the companies you've seen mentioned here and many others, they do just that. So in addition to senior executives being paid very handsomely for meeting the financial bottom lines, there's mo phrases of double or triple bottom lines where people are being, leaders are being paid for soft skills and soft results or the abstractions of ethics and culture and values. Those are ways to change behavior. I'd say there's two things. I think, first of all, we're not going to transform business by creating some new tricky model. I mean, this is part of the Marxian fallacy that if you just change the economic system, everything will fall into place. No, you have individual human beings who work in businesses. And unless they have a moral vision, it's not going to happen. But the second point is, this is what we've seen with the whole corporate social responsibility movement that you brought up, brought up Britt. And that is, that movement, I would argue, is a disaster for business ethics and a disaster for society. Because one, it substitutes actual questions of right and wrong and good and bad with what's politically or socially fashionable at the time, one. Two, it's relativistic. Enron had a fantastic corporate social responsibility program. It's largely ineffective. The money is usually goes, it goes to a different groups and it ultimately ends up being a protection racket so that it's like a new transaction cost of doing business in the United States. You have to pay off the Greens and the Catholics and the pro-aborts and the anti-aborts and the hunters and PETA so that they just leave you alone so you can do business. And that's a substitute for ethics. And then and you call a, that right. ethics. Yeah. And, and, and that's a substitute for ethics. So then what happens is you have all these people say, we are a green company. Yes, but are we telling the truth? Are we treating people as means to an end or an end in themselves? Well, we keep coming back to this question, and it seems to me that, that and then maybe it's the answer, which is that at the top of these enterprises, Prizes. You need virtuous people. Of course. You need, and there's and the no bottom. way around it. That, that the system itself will not, by itself, by its natural financial incentives, generate virtue. That's Free true in society. every institution, not just business. That's true in universities. That's true in churches and religious communities. But you know what? To produce such people, 
There's only one institution that can really do it well, the institution of the family. Right. And if you let that fall apart as we have to such a large extent in this country, the consequences will show themselves up in scandals in business, scandals in universities, scandals in churches, scandals Let's in Let's get one last comment and we'll bring in the students. Okay. Scott Ray responds. See, so all of the executives here realize something very important, that the people who work for them want to do more than just make a living. They want to contribute to a cause that's important. And that, that spirit is what animates these organizations. And the, yeah, it's, it, moral standards are clear and all that, but people have a, a vision for what, what they do being important. I remember hearing Bill Pollard, a service master, interviewing the janitors who, in their, in their hospital systems, who, who admitted that these hospitals don't run if we don't do our jobs well. Good point. Well, it, it, it gets you to the question. He found a business reason to do it, didn't he? And it was effective for his enterprise. And, and so in many cases, virtuous behavior in management generates energy in the workforce, which generates productivity. And then that does go to the bottom line. But do you want to comment on that? I mean, you, you do a lot with a business executives, so. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I would agree with what you're saying. But what, maybe we'll let another student chime in with a question, then I'll comment on that. Go ahead. Right there. You again. Hi, my name is Sherrod Bauman, um, and my question is this. We've already kind of discussed the importance of having moral executives and kind of the relative unimportance of uh, corporate social responsibility. But my question is more about the um, Anglo-Saxon uh, capitalism model in general. Um, it's not the only system that exists in the world as far as capitalism is concerned. Uh, you have nations like Japan where instead of um, companies being forced to maximize profit, they're actually acts to uh, maximize value added, which is not only the profit of the company, but also the wages that they pay out to their uh, employees, et cetera. And I was wondering what you guys thought of that as a way to develop community within the um, company and foster social responsibility as a whole. Uh, implied, if not actually asked by the student, which is what, what is it about our way of doing this that suggests that it's the way we ought to be doing it. Maybe we ought to be imitating Europe or Japan or whoever. What about it? Well, our, our system is not perfect, and no system is. Uh, and I think we need to be thinking about ways to improve it. Uh, and in thinking about ways to improve it, we should look at other models. Now, we're going to find that those other models, including Japan, have flaws as well as good, good points. But we need to think critically and creatively about it. One tension I think we have to recognize is the tension that is created by the need to stimulate demand for goods and services. It's good for business that we want lots of toys. It's good for business that we want lots of material things. Now, how do we do that in a way that doesn't undermine other values that are equally or more important? And that's, I think that, that's the challenge of society. I mean, this is, there's no perfect system and you have consumerism in a socialist economy, you have consumerism in social democratic and in capitalist society. So I think fundamentally, like I work at an economic think tank and I don't think economics are actually that important. I don't think economics are the foundation of society. And what's the foundation of society is the family, religion, you know, culture. This is what has to be transformed. And, and when we transform that, then a market on economy can flourish because free societies require free people. And the market cannot create free people. Once again here, we've heard a good case made of why moral behavior is essential to the proper functioning of our society. In the next session, we apply ethics to public life. See you then. Shane Morris here again. Thanks for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast and our special presentation of Chuck Colson's and Robert George's series, Doing the Right Thing. Join us next week for part six, Ethics in Public Life. And if you're interested in purchasing the Doing the Right Thing DVD series, please come to our online bookstore at breakpoint.org. For the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris.